All right. I, okay, I'm gonna have to, to restart really quick. Okay. So I'm not gonna say the key terms because that's gonna be clear, but I'm just gonna repeat myself a little bit. So if you were on the live stream and I you just were able to hear me because I was unmuted, I was just introducing the first slide on our lecture on the subject of economic growth. Okay, so there are two uh, images on the slide that you can see behind me. On the left, you see the relative share of world manufacturing output for different nation states and empires. And on the right, you see uh, standard time zones adopted under the Standard Time Act of 1918. So on the left side, if you look at the graph around 1800, you see that the manufacturing output of what is now the United States was much smaller than that of European countries, particularly the United Kingdom, which experienced the world's first industrial revolution associated with the rise of steam power and the use of coal in particular. But by 1900, the United States had outpassed the UK and was becoming the world's leading manufacturing power. At the heart of economic growth in the late 19th century US was the railroad industry. Um, so, over 120,000 miles of railroad tracks were laid in the United States between 1850 and 1890. This was important because in the 19th century, prior to the rise of the railroad, transportation was dramatically slower. If you did not live near a coast and you didn't have access to maritime transportation and you were talking about using horse-drawn wagons and other slow modes of transport, Railroads made rapid transport over land expanses much more feasible. And this is particularly important in a country the size of the United States, right? So railroads made it possible to build out the nation's economy further away from rivers and ports and to transport goods over land. And as you can imagine, that has enormous consequences for a variety of economic sectors, right? Think about the economics, for example, of the lumber industry. If you're trying to transport lumber from the forests of northern Minnesota or Illinois or Michigan to New York City, after the railroad, think about how much cheaper and faster it would be. Same thing with refining petroleum drilled in a place like Pennsylvania or coal dug in a place like West Virginia or Wyoming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So railroads made things much faster and cheaper than they had ever been before in history. They made it possible for people to live in more places than they had before. They accelerated the population movement from the east to the west. And of course, this is happening in the aftermath, not only the Civil War, but the conquest of Native American lands that I discussed in the lecture on that topic. So railroads, among other things, changed people's sense of time, right? Two hours away meant something different after the railroad than two hours away meant before the railroad, okay? And Actually, prior to the late 19th century, there was much more irregularity in timekeeping. So for example, in 1882, there was no Eastern Standard Time. So New York and Boston were 11 minutes, 45 seconds apart. If you're trying to run railroads, that becomes dangerous. Why would it be dangerous for, to have irregularities in time schedules between different places if you're trying to operate a railroad system? Exactly, they can crash into each other, right? So you need to be precise down to the second if you're going to operate something as complicated as a continental railroad network, which is what Americans had to do. So railroad time was the sort of initial template for standard time. The railroads agreed in 1883 to coordinate times across the expanse of the United States. They divided the country into four standard time zones, Pacific, Mountain, Central, and of course, Eastern. And it wasn't until 1918 that Congress passed the Standard Time Act, which eliminated remaining irregularities. Now, railroads were at the heart of this expanding complex of industrial production, which included coal mines. Railroads ran on coal, right? Um, it included the production of steel, which was cheapened dramatically by the Bessemer process starting in the 1850s, which you read about in your textbook for today. Steel rails were more durable, lasted longer, the production of steel itself required coal and other raw materials. Um, so different 
cities and towns and regions specialized in different kinds of economic activity. And with railroads, they expanded the markets to which producers could sell their goods. So for example, prior to the arrival of a railroad, if you were a farmer, your market was relatively limited. If you were in say Nebraska producing wheat. After the arrival of railroads, you could potentially sell to a much larger market. It tended to reduce the cost, it increased competition, um, and it facilitated longer transportation networks and supply chains. If you look at the overall U.S. economy, the outputs of good, output of goods and services in the U.S. is about $9 billion in 1860. In 1890, it's $37 billion. So the economy grows four times in size in the late 19th century. Uh, and railroads are at the heart of it. But at the same time, corporations themselves are changing. This is the era of the rise of big business and the modern corporation. And indeed, railroad corporations, many historians have argued, pioneer the modern corporate form because railroads require a complicated bureaucracy to operate. This graph here, or, or table, um, shows the transformation of the modern corporation over the course of the 19th to the early 20th century. So if you look at corporations in the early 20th century, they're, they're relatively small operations, legally chartered, often to do things like build bridges. Um, typically, uh, uh, they're operating with local markets. Uh, they're, they're relatively specialized. They have pretty simple management structures. So for example, workshops often have fewer than 50 workers, sometimes as, fewer, as few as a dozen or less. Um, you know, the technology was relatively simple. Certainly in 1800, you would have been talking about uh, wind and water power and human muscle power primarily. In the second half of the 19th century, corporations become larger. They introduce more divisions. There's more layers of management, right? Uh, and you have a separation between typically a board of directors, different layers of management, supervisors, and then workers. Corporations also open divisions that specialize in things like marketing, right? Uh, they, they, they need legal departments. Moreover, corporations expand through a few different tactics. The creation of trusts, monopolies, and oligopolies, horizontal integration, and vertical integration. Let's break down what those terms mean. Does anybody know what a monopoly is? Exactly, right? So when we think about markets in textbooks, they're often described as uh, uh, you know, the, the exchange of goods on a competitive basis between buyers and sellers, right? But a monopoly is a situation where a market is cornered or controlled by a single firm. An oligopoly is where it's controlled by a small number of firms, right? Um, and in the situation of oligopoly or monopoly, often firms took the form of trusts in the late 19th century. A trust essentially uh, is a, a legal arrangement whereby a parent company owns subsidiary companies. And the most famous of these was the Standard Oil Trust uh, launched by John D. Rockefeller uh, beginning in the 1870s. So the Standard Oil Trust is a classic example of a monopoly. By 1880, the Standard Oil Trust controlled about 90% of all the oil refining in the United States. Rockefeller essentially controlled America's oil supply. Well, this is before the rise of the internal combustion engine, um, which would make petroleum and places like Houston, where we are here, much more critical to the nation's economy. Uh, but petroleum is already a booming economic sector uh, particularly in places like Pennsylvania by the 1870s and 1880s, and Rockefeller controlled it. And he did so through both horizontal integration and vertical integration. Horizontal integration is where a firm buys up other firms in the same industry. So that would be an oil company buying up other oil companies, steel company buying up their steel companies, et cetera. Vertical integration is where you don't just buy up other companies in your industry, you buy up other industries in your whole supply chain. So in the case of Rockefeller, he bought up the railroads that transported the oil from the refineries and bought up the warehouses next to uh, railroad stations and the like. And indeed, he would diversify into a whole range of economic sectors um, 
creating this kind of mega corporation. So Pine, uh, Henry Ford and the automobile industry would do vertical integration on an even bigger scale. So Ford didn't just produce cars, he also controlled rubber plantations that produced rubber for the tires of the cars. He bought up ore mines and tracts of forest for the production of metals and wood for Ford Model T cars, which we'll talk about a little bit when we get to the 20th century. But uh, Rockefeller pioneers uh, sort of modern monopoly, trust, uh, horizontal and vertical integration. Standard Oil got so big and powerful that Americans became afraid of entities like this. And, and we could also talk about the Carnegie Steel Trust, uh, JP Morgan's Banking Trust, and numerous others. So through this process of corporate consolidation, you have the emergence of these mega fortunes. So in the case of Rockefeller, by the time he died in 1937, he was worth something close to $250 billion in today's money. Um, so people like Morgan, Carnegie, Jay Gould, J.P. Morgan, uh, I already said his name, but, uh, you know, the Vanderbilts, these people were often derided as robber barons, which is kind of a, an analogy to a European aristocrat. And there was a genuine fear about the consolidation of their power. Uh, there's a political cartoon by Udo Kepler on the right side of the slide, and it depicts standard oil as an octopus which is sort of reaching out its tentacles to control more and more of the nation's economy. You see it's got its tentacles wrapped around the US uh, Congress uh, and, and it's covering all of this territory. And there was this sense on the part of many Americans that big business is becoming too powerful and uh, there, something needed to be done to regulate it. Although there was also a certain um, uh, admiration for the technological innovations associated with the industrialization process, but there's a fear of the power of those who controlled it. The time period between Reconstruction and the so-called Progressive Era, uh, roughly 1877 to 1900, is often called the Gilded Age, although actually it's named after a novel that came out even before Reconstruction was over, uh, The Gilded Age is held today by Mark Twain released in 1873. So this is a satirical novel like much of Twain's work. And the term gilded is kind of a giveaway, right? Because unlike gold, something that is gilded is merely painted with a gold surface, but underneath it's not really gold. So the implication is that this is a time period that might look shiny on the surface, but if you dig in, it's actually less impressive. Uh, and that was sort of Twain's take on America in the 1870s. So the book uh, is basically about political corruption. Um, so the characters include political lobbyists in Washington, D.C. The term lobbyist actually was popularized for the first time, at least on a large scale in, in the mid-19th century, particularly the post-Civil War era. Uh, and it describes basically the, both the Republican and the Democratic Party during the era of Ulysses S. Grant. This was an era of enormous political corruption and lots of scandals. Um, there were lots of high profile examples I could cite. I'll just give two. One is the so-called Black Friday scandal. Another is the whiskey ring scandal. Uh, in the case of the Black Friday scandal, a railroad tycoon named Jay Gould, one of the so-called robber barons of the era, an enormously wealthy guy, uh, he bribed the assistant treasury secretary under President Grant, Daniel Butterfield, with $10,000 to get inside information on Grant's uh, fiscal policies. And eventually, Jay Gould and his colleague James Fisk managed to talk President Grant into taking a trip aboard Gould's yacht uh, from, on a trip from New York to Boston in June of 1869. And Gould and Fisk convinced President Grant to restrict the gold supply of the United States to increase gold prices. And they pitched it to the president as an effort to help uh, uh, Western farmers. But of course, they were actually plotting to corner the gold market because they knew that if the US government restricted the gold supply, it would drive up gold prices. So after convincing Grant to limit gold purchases, they uh, bought up gold supplies in New York City. They made a killing. The scandal was exposed, and uh, although uh, Gold and Fisk were never charged with wrongdoing, the scandal made Grant look bad. What are you doing on this railroad tycoon's yacht, agreeing to help him corner the gold market? Um, 
There were numerous similar scandals. So for example, officials in the Grant administration's treasury department were found to be taking bribes from whiskey distillers who wanted to evade taxes on whiskey. And this became known as the whiskey ring scandal. So those implicated a Republican administration, but the Democratic Party was no less corrupt. Um, for example, Tammany Hall was the Democratic Party political machine in control of New York City politics. And Tammany Hall systematically bribed police department, city council, mayoral officials, and others uh, to get political favors. Uh, Uh, aisle, so to speak. And big business came to have so much influence in politics that you got satirical depictions of the situation, like the, the cartoon of the left called the Boston of the Senate, in which you see these sort of top hatted, uh, corpulent uh, bags of money representing different business interests, lording it over the senators on the lowly Senate floor. So there's the Steel Beam Trust, the Copper Trust, of course, the Standard Oil Trust and numerous others, uh, and then it says that there's a special entrance into the US Senate for monopolists, right? And then the people are somewhere in the back and not really being listened to. Now this is of course a caricature, but, in, but it contained a great deal of truth. It wasn't until 1911 with the 17th Amendment that Americans could even elect their own senators. So you had a totally unelected Senate in the 19th century. They were appointees. Typically senators were wealthy businessmen uh, and they often use political office to advance their personal business interests in sometimes a very crude way. So for example, on the right side of the slide, there's a guy named Calvin Bryce, who's a Democrat from Ohio. He was basically a railroad speculator who bought a Senate seat for himself in 1890. And this kind of thing was common. Stanford University is named after the railroad executive uh, and industrialist Leland Stanford. And Stanford, while he was a senator from California between 1885 and 1893, and he was the wealthiest man in the US Senate, also controlled the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific Railroad. And he used his position as a senator to advance his railroad interests, although not solely. Uh, there's a, another famous example, the Michigan uh, uh, Railroad executive and industrialist, uh, James McMillan, would you know, go to his office on the Senate floor and make deals and stock trades on legislation after passing it would benefit his railroad interest. So you go into the chamber, you pass a bill that benefits your, your business, and then you literally go to your office and hook up to a telegraph line and order stock, stock sales. You know, there were no regulations of insider trading, campaign finance whatsoever. Um, and this made Americans very cynical about politics, right? Moreover, the economy was repeatedly convulsed by panics and depressions uh, in the 19th century. Uh, this happened before the Civil War, during the Jacksonian period, and even going back to the Revolutionary and early Republic. But especially in the late 19th century, you have a series of long lasting depressions that result in prolonged bouts of unemployment, bankruptcy, business failure, um, and suffering. So I'll just cite a few examples. The, one of the worst was the Panic of 1873. The Panic of 1873, like many financial panics of the Gilded Age, was caused by railroad speculation. Specifically, um, it was caused by the failure of the Northern Pacific Railroad and the Jay Cook Company. So the Jay Cook Company was the biggest financier of the Union military effort during the Civil War. And in 1867, Congress awarded the Jay Cook Company and the Northern Pacific Railroad this massive land grant that went from Minnesota all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And Jay Cook made a lot of money selling basically bonds or securities from the Northern Pacific Railroad to private investors. But he took out more debt than he could pay back and the railroad turned out not to be profitable. And as a result, the Northern Pacific went bankrupt in 1873. This then triggered a larger financial panic where investors started making runs on New York banks. Prior to the Great Depression, there was no system of federal deposit insurance in the United States. So if you had a deposit in a bank and the bank failed, you could actually lose your money. And so when panics happened and banks failed, people often started taking their money out of banks, which in turn triggered further bank failures. And this is what happened in 1873. So you have 
a rush by investors to sell off their railroad stocks, fearing that their railroad will go bankrupt like the Northern Pacific did, not wanting to be the one holding the bag. And people taking their money out of banks, which were themselves invested in the railroads. And so you get a chain reaction effect, um, including the disinvestment of many European investors in American railroad securities. And by the middle of the year, about half of American railroads have gone bankrupt. And within a year, about 4 million people have lost their jobs. One in five workers in the US lost their job during the panic of 1873, which lasted for about four years or the subsequent depression. It got to a point where so-called tramps and hobos, essentially homeless people became a common sight in American cities. Homeless in Canada sprung up everywhere, but a million vagrants were arrested in 1877 alone. Now, this growing problem, homelessness, unemployment, people going under, losing in their life savings, coincided with an enormous accumulation of wealth by those Americans who did not uh, uh, lose. These panics seem to create winners and losers. And when businesses went under, those that did not often were able to buy up their competitors and consolidate wealth further. This is a period of surging inequality. One economic historian has estimated that in the 1850s, the richest 1% of Americans had about 12% of US wealth. But by the 1890s, the richest 1% of Americans had over 50% of US wealth. So why do you think economic inequality increased during the Gilded Age. How can you go from uh, the richest 1% controlling 12% to over 50% in just a few decades? Yes. I saw a hand up. The framework that you just stated, um, we started buying up all those and selling businesses. Yeah, I mean, there was an enormous, um, there was enormous economic growth. There were massive increases in productivity. There was a lot of money made, but there were also a lot of people that went out of business or lost their jobs or saw, saw their, uh, you know, companies outcompeted. So there were winners and losers. Um, and this contributed to this problem of concentration. There was also, there, there weren't mechanisms for redistributing the wealth that was being generated. Right. Um, so you didn't have, for example, a progressive taxation system. Um, labor unions did not represent most American workers. And so there, were, there weren't a lot of checks and balances on the generation of wealth. Um, but this is also a matter of debate among historians. And there isn't one single correct answer. But whatever your ideology or your perspective, if you went to a city like New York, the inequalities of the Gilded Age would stare you in the face. So you could go within a few miles to see, uh, from seeing something like the Cornelius Vanderbilt II Second Mansion on Fifth Avenue, this was known as Millionaire's Row, to seeing people living in shanties for a dollar a month, right? This is the same city and close to being the same neighborhood, just a few miles apart, right? Um, on the side of the wealthy, there was a great deal of extravagance and luxury. Um, Indeed, some European observers thought that the American upper classes were insecure because of the lack of a tradition of, a, of hereditary aristocracy or nobility in the United States. Many of the so-called nouveau riche or the new rich wanted to style themselves after European aristocrats. So for example, the wife of the railroad investor, William Vanderbilt, Alva Vanderbilt, spent $250,000 on a dress ball at her French style chateau on Fifth Avenue. Um, many of the wealthy built palatial mansions modeled on European castles. Uh, French chateaus were very popular, uh, not only on Fifth Avenue in New York, but places like Chicago's Lakeshore Drive, the hills in San Francisco, the main line outside of Philadelphia, Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and there were, there were stories that circulated about the, the amount of sort of money that was being thrown around. Um, so I'll just give one example. There was a story about one magnet throwing a party for his dog and giving it a diamond collar worth $15,000 uh, during the depression of the 1890s. There was one party at Delmonico's restaurant in New York City where the guests smoked cigarettes wrapped in $100 bills. And this was happening while you have all these tramps roaming the streets or people living in shacks, right? And this kind of thing generated a lot of anger. But there were some who said this was not a problem. The 
the British uh, philosopher, biologist, uh, and, and social commentator Herbert Spencer uh, was very popular with many American uh, elites, um, uh, such as Andrew Carnegie, a big fan of Spencer's work. And there were American advocates of Spencer's ideas, such as William Graham Sumner, who was a political scientist at Yale. So Herbert Spencer and his followers like Sumner advocated a kind of a philosophy sometimes called social Darwinism, although they didn't generally use the term themselves. This was inspired by uh, uh, Charles Darwin's famous theory of natural selection in his book on the origins of species published in 1859. Although it should be noted that uh, Darwin himself did not advocate social Darwinism. This was kind of a simplistic application of his ideas to society. Um, and you'll know this if you, if you study biology, it's not the same thing as the theory of natural selection. But social Darwinism essentially said that inequalities in society reflected a struggle for fitness. And those who came out on top were more fit than those who ended up on the bottom. So for example, William Graham Sumner said in his book, The Challenge of Facts, the millionaires are a product of natural selection, acting on the whole body of men to pick out those who can meet the requirement of certain work to be done. It is because they are thus selected that wealth, both their own and then entrusted to them, aggregates in their hands. Um, he further stated, there is the intensest competition for their place and occupation. This assures us that all who are competent for this function will be employed in it, so that the cost of it will be reduced to the lowest terms. Um, he also believed that poverty was necessary because it created a check and, and induced competition, right? Uh, John D. Rockefeller's son, um, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. stated in 1904, the growth of a large business is merely a survival of the fittest. This is not an evil tendency in business, merely the working out of a law of nature and a law of God. So that was one perspective. There was also a lot of criticism though of the economic system. And in particular, there was a great deal of labor militancy. Many workers chose to go out on strike and join in labor unions during the Gilded Age. Uh, there had been uh, strikes and union activity even before the Civil War, uh, particularly in industrial centers like Lowell, Massachusetts, and amongst uh, skilled craft workers in places like Philadelphia and the shoe industry as early as the uh, even, even the end of the 18th century, but particularly in the 1820s, 1830s. But it takes off on a larger scale than ever before after the Civil War because of industrialization, the larger scale of factory production, the build out of the railroad system, and the recurrence of these financial panics and depressions, which put the squeeze on workers' living standards. It's estimated by historians that between uh, uh, 18... 81 and 1897, there are 18,000 strikes in the United States. Um, the largest of these uh, prior to 1886 was the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. So I talked before about the Panic of 1873 and how half of the railroads in the United States went bankrupt virtually overnight. The railroads that did not go bankrupt stayed afloat by cutting their workers' wages and laying people off. So for example, railroad workers' wages fell about 60% between 1873 and 1877. So if you worked on the railroad and you kept your job, you were making a lot less money four years after the start of the panic of 1873. You can imagine how difficult that would have been for many families. If you work for wages, if you have a job, imagine if your wages were cut 60%, how would that affect the quality of your life? Moreover, there were additional wage cuts. In July 1877, for example, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, after a round of wage cuts, imposed another 10% wage cuts on their workers. And their workers basically had, had, had it and launched a strike. The strike then went like wildfire and it spread across these railroad lines. It spread from Baltimore all the way to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and then to dozens of railroads lines across the country. This was the first time because of the build out of the railroad network that workers could go on strike in one place and then it would spread across thousands of miles. And so pretty soon, much of the nation's railroad network was shut down. Uh, there were mass uh, uh, strikes uh, and, and rallies held across the country. The great railroad strikes spread to the great cities and workers shut down uh, most of the economy of Chicago, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and dozens of smaller places. 
Um, and it got very militant. So for example, in Pittsburgh, striking workers, including many women and children, that is workers and their families, barricaded themselves inside one railroad station and the Pittsburgh police refused to fire on them. And so the state militia was called in to break, to break them out. And there was a shootout in which several people were bayoneted and about 20 people were killed. Um, similarly, dozens of strikers were killed in Chicago and some of them were dumped into unmarked wine pits. Um, in many cases, uh, there was property destruction. So for example, in retaliation for the massacre in Pittsburgh, hundreds of railroad cars were destroyed. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, enormous property damage, over $244 million in today's dollars. Uh, three miles of railroad track outside the city of Pittsburgh were simply torn up by angry mobs. Now, this also provoked intervention. As we saw in the case of Pittsburgh, this was more than local police departments could handle. And in many cases, governors sent in state militia. And indeed, the US military was repeatedly deployed to crush strikes. In fact, between 1877 and 1900, US presidents ordered the US Army to crush no fewer than 11 strikes. Um, and the National Guard broke up between 118 and 160 labor disputes. Workers didn't only go on strike. They also formed the largest union organizations ever seen before in American history. The most important of these during the Gilded Age was the Knights of Labor. So the Knights of Labor provides a good window into how workers were organizing in new ways during the Gilded Age. They started out like many of the old pre-Civil War unions as a kind of an artisan's guild of skilled workers. So in 1869, they were founded by Philadelphia garment workers led by a man named Uriah Stevens. But he would be replaced in 1879 by Terence Powderly, who was the mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And under uh, Powderly, even before him actually, the Knights expanded their ranks to include workers across lines of skill, craft, and indeed, ultimately race and gender. Um, so instead of just trying to represent one group of workers like the garment workers, or the tailors, or the carpenters, or the iron molders, they were open to virtually anybody who is not uh, a large business owner or a manufacturer of liquor. Um, so they opened themselves even to some small business owners, to managers, and to workers across lines of craft and skill. Um, initially, they were closed to women, but under pressure from women labor activists like Mary Sterling, who led a strike of lady shoemakers, uh, uh, they opened their ranks. And actually, by 1880, the Knights of Labor Constitution advocated equal rights for equal work, and the Knights of Labor also supported women's suffrage, at least at the top, although there were male Knights of Labor leaders who opposed it. Uh, women constituted about 10% of Knights of Labor members by the early uh, 1880s, um, and Knights of Labor leaders like uh, Leonardo Berry, who was an Irish mill worker from Amsterdam, New York, uh, uh, played a key role in the national organization and the women's suffrage movement. Also, the Knights of Labor were open to African Americans, which had not been true of all unions prior to the 1870s and 1880s. In fact, there were about 60,000 African American members of the Knights of Labor by 1886. There's a famous case where one Knights of Labor leader from Brooklyn, New York, named Frank Farrell, uh, who actually was a member of the General Executive Board of the Union, came to the Knights of Labor Convention in Richmond, Virginia. But because he was black, he was denied admission to a hotel where the white members were staying. In response to Farrell being denied admission to the hotel, the Knights staged a rally in protest. And actually, um, uh, they, they participated in a march with lo local African-American leaders to a local picnic ground in protest of the Jim Crow segregation laws in Richmond. Um, and refused to stay at the whites only hotel and stayed at an African American hotel instead. So by the standards of their time, the Knights of Labor were pretty uh, egalitarian with regard to African Americans. I don't mean to suggest there wasn't racism against African Americans, but there were a lot of black Knights of Labor members. About a third of the members in the South were black. Now, unfortunately, that did not extend to Chinese immigrants. And I'll talk about the case of Chinese exclusion on Wednesday. Parents Powderly supported the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And most tragically of all, some Knights of Labor 
members in the West participated in anti-Chinese violence, notably at the Rock Springs Massacre 1885, in which dozens of Chinese mine workers were killed by white miners, including members of the Knights of Labor. So the Knights of Labor have a mixed record on matters of race. Um, they were pretty progressive with regard to African Americans, not so much with regard to Chinese immigrants. Okay, but you can see the sheer scale of organization if you look at this map, right? So take a look, each, each of the dots on this map represents a local assembly of the Knights of Labor. Map across the United States. So where were Knights of Labor assemblies concentrated? What parts of the country based on that map? The Northeast and the Midwest, right? But they also existed across the South, including here in Texas. But they were more densely concentrated in the Northeast and the Midwest. And why might that be? Right, it was more industrialized. So they were more industrial workers. Okay, but they were all over the place, including here in Texas. Um, many workers involved in the labor movement rallied around the cause of the eight hour day. Workers were also organizing for health and safety. Many of them set up producers cooperatives. Some got involved in politics and tried to set up third parties. But one thing that almost everybody could agree on was that workers' hours were too long. Uh, it was typical to work 10 to 12 hours uh, in the United States between about 1870 and 1920. There were very few uh, restrictions on the ability of employers to compel their workers to stay in the workplace for long periods. Um, so the eight hour movement really took off and it was taken up by the Knights of Labor as well as other unions like the American Federation of Labor. Um, and the Knights of Labor increased in their membership to over 700,000 by 1886. And that year, the largest upheaval of American workers in history ever occurred, at least in, in the 19th century. Over 600,000 workers went on strike in 1886, and the largest actions took place around the demand for the eight hour day in May of that year. Um, some 300,000 American workers participated in eight hour day demonstrations just in May of 1886, um, and about 200,000 went on strike for the eight hour day. Um, there were, you know, at least 1,500 separate strikes. Of those, only about 42,000 workers won an eight hour day. Most did not get one. Um, and there was a big dispute about this. Terence Powderly actually discouraged strikes because he wanted the Knights of Labor to get some political respectability. Unions historically have been criminalized and seen as kind of illegal conspiracies by the to declare that strikes were illegal. American workers didn't get the right to strike under the law really until 1935. So people did it anyway, though, because they felt they had no other choice. Um, so despite the fact that Terence Powderly didn't support these strikes, the mass of the Knights went out anyway. Now, the agitation for the eight-hour day tragically uh, was derailed in Chicago by a violent episode referred to by historians as the Haymarket Affair. So Chicago had grown rapidly from just a few thousand people in the 1830s to a large city um, of hundreds of thousands. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, Chicago was the center of meat packing, the lumber industry uh, 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 had a large banking sector uh, and a commodities exchange. And many of those who moved to Chicago were immigrants, particularly from places like, like what would become Germany in the 1870s, but German speaking immigrants. Uh, Irish immigrants um, uh, and, and later Italians, Jews, African Americans, and others. Um, one of the manufacturers in Chicago who was particularly well known uh, was, uh, was Cyrus McCormick's Reaper Works, which produced reapers that were used by farmers across the West. Um, and there was a strike for the eight hour day at the McCormick Reaper Works in May of 1886. There was a clash between police and strikers at the Reaper Works in which police killed two unarmed workers. And if you read the documents assigned for this week on the Haymarket Affair, you will see the perspective of the workers, of the police, and, as, and of uh, one particular police captain who illustrated it. Um, so police killed two striking workers, 
In response to this, there's a protest rally held at Chicago's Haymarket Square on May 4th, 1886. It's a huge rally initially, uh, which attracts tens of thousands of people. Um, and it's a fairly mild affair by the standards of the time initially, but it dwindles down later into the evening to about 600 people. And there are some people who get up on these hay wagons and yell incendiary slogans. Um, but there are large numbers of police who are at the rally in case any violence occurs. And there are varying accounts to this day about what happened and there's still no clear uh, picture. Um, the police claim that somebody in the crowd threw a bomb with the intent of killing the police. And that then people in the crowd started firing on the police and only in self-defense, the police started firing back. Whereas others in the crowd say, nobody knows who threw the bomb. The police reacted to it by firing wildly into the crowd and that most of the people who died were killed by other police firing weapons into each other's ranks. What is known is that at least 15 people were killed. Many were hit by shrapnel from the bomb. One policeman was killed by the bomb um, and there was firing both from people in the crowd and from the cops. In the aftermath of this, Four people were hanged by the state of Illinois on charges of inciting a riot. Um, they included leading uh, German immigrant anarchists and, and radicals like Albert, uh, August Spies, as well as Albert Parsons, who was not a German immigrant, but worked closely with them. Although they never found out who threw the bomb, these four people were hanged because they published incendiary literature, in some cases advocating that workers arm themselves and even have dynamite. But they didn't prove that they were behind throwing up the bomb. Um, and to this day, there is a dispute about uh, who actually threw it. But with regard to the Knights of Labor, the Haymarket Affair triggered an aggressive crackdown against uh, unions. So in the city of Chicago, many Knights of Labor leaders were arrested. And in fact, uh, Michael Schack, um, who uh, wrote the book that I excerpted an image from in today's documents, would later be charged uh, with corruption and bribery himself and actually the planting of evidence. So there was a lot of corruption within the police department, deeply flawed investigation. Many innocent people were rounded up and persecuted. Uh, the Knights of Labor went into decline in the aftermath of the Haymarket Affair and this kind of crackdown on labor and efforts to deport immigrants. Uh, and moreover, in the South, efforts by Knights of Labor members to organize African-American sugarcane workers in Louisiana, for example, were met with white supremacist terrorism, notably in the Thebada massacre of 1887. So if you look at this graph on the left, it shows a steep decline in the membership of the Knights of Labor from the height of 750,000 in 1886 to only a few thousand by the end of the century. That the year of the Haymarket Affair, you see the founding of the American Federation of Labor uh, by Samuel Gompers, his picture on the right side of the slide. I'm going to end with this. So, Samuel Gompers uh, was from a family of Dutch Jews. He was born in 1850 um, in New York City. Um, or, excuse me, he was born in England, but his family came to New York City when he was 13 years old. And he became a cigar maker and a trade unionist as a teenager and later became the president of a cigar makers international union local in 1875. So he comes up through this immigrant cigar making family in the New York Jewish immigrant community. But in 1886, he plays a role in the founding of the American Federation of Labor. And unlike the Knights of Labor, they pursue a narrower, more conservative strategy. So whereas the Knights were open across lines of race, uh, certainly to African-Americans, although they embrace Chinese inclusion, and relatively open to women, the American Federation of Labor adopted a more exclusionary attitude, primarily focused on organizing native-born workers, craft and skilled workers, rather than unskilled and non-unionized workers. Also, they eschewed political organizing. They didn't support the formation, for example, of a labor party. One of the reasons why the independent labor party was Gompers advocated what he called pure and simple unionism, which said that unions should focus only on increasing wages and improving working conditions for their members, but they should stay away from political radicalism, political parties, and all that dangerous stuff that the Knights of Labor got involved in, which he thought was responsible for the disaster of 1886. So as a result, the American uh, labor movement adopted a somewhat narrower approach, which wouldn't really be challenged in an effective way 
uh, except by some radicals on the margins until the 1930s with the founding of the CIO. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, but I want you to take note of the lecture quiz question for today. How did the US economy change during the Gilded Age and how did these changes contribute to class conflict? Any questions before we wrap up? Can I clarify anything? Okay, thanks everybody. See you Wednesday. Thank you.